Hey guys, it's Sean Rips here with some Slay the Spire YouTube content. Ooh. Uh, I had a really fun Ironclad run, and people suggested that the VOD was worth putting on YouTube, but I was playing music during it and stuff like that, so any VOD I put up is going to be muted, and eh. uh, I thought that I'd do a VOD review instead, so I'm going to look at this run. I guess the, the end is already spoiled, we win. And I'm just going to talk about why decisions are happening, what's going through my head, and how this deck, um, one of the weirdest Ironclad decks I've ever played, ends up, one, being correct to build, because we had to build this deck and have it make sense to put the cards we put in the card, uh, put the cards that we put into the deck in the deck, and two, how it actually won while doing so. So I'm going to be focusing mostly on card decisions. I'm going to be probably skipping through fights largely. This is all being done live i'm not i don't have time to do like a bunch of editing and stuff so we're just gonna look at the run and uh see what happens that's past me past me hopefully i won't be yelling too much about about the things that past me does um sometimes past me is not quite as smart as present me but he's a likable guy anyway is right at the beginning of the run uh without getting super into it we have like a an interesting path through the dungeon which gives us a lot of choice in the second half of the act we can choose between like going to up to two stores in the second half of the act or taking campfires and elite fights i think i'm just looking at the stuff obtaining 100 gold here becomes valuable in the second half of the act but uh you do have to play the first half of the act before it's likely to be valuable if you're not going to a store early choosing a card to obtain is always fine Trading starting relic is a little bit iffy on ironclad. You can see, can you see my cursor? Yeah, you can see here's the node where going left gets us another lead in campfire and going right gets us a bunch of events and stores. So for low health, that's a very safe place to head. Gonna skip ahead a bit while past even messes around with Twitch chat and blah, 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 blah. Dolphin chemists in chat, great guy. <laughs> All right, are we picking something? We decided to go with 100 gold, so the idea is that we're going to be, you know, a little bit weaker at the start of the run, but we will be able to hopefully um, spend that gold on something useful at some point. I'm going to skip through this Jawworm fight. I don't think there's anything too exciting about it. And our first selection is between Thunderclap, Armaments, and Clothesline. So I actually have an entire YouTube video about why I love Clothesline early. Just want to give a nod to Armaments. I think Armaments is a pretty nice card to pick up early. It has a lot of value. If you're just going to play an Armaments, even unupgraded, and like upgrade a defend in your hand, and then play a defend, Armaments is effectively blocking for 8 that turn, and making your defend block for more for the rest of the fight. So Armaments is a nice card to have for like a Bulan fight, for Tri-Sentry fight, and often for the boss fight as well. And it's a pretty reasonable upgrade early. But Clothesline is, I think, uh, it might be the best common to add to your deck on the first floor as Ironclad. It's definitely up there. It's a very, 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 very solid card. It deals extra damage for you. It lets you um, sink more of your energy into damage on turns where you draw not enough attacks to deal damage with. Not usually a problem for Ironclad because Ironclad's deck is very attack heavy at the beginning of the game, but it may be come a problem later and we'll always have that clothesline and it's a source of weak ironclad doesn't have very many sources of weak and sources of weak are very valuable so skip through this burger fight a little bit we're already down to not the most hp unfortunately and our second card selection is at havoc burning pact oh the reason we don't have that much hp is we took uh, gold from an event right <laughs> I'm playing the game soundtrack um, as background noise while I talk so that I'm not just talking without background at all. That might be a little bit too loud. I believe this is a boss music track. Whatever. So we're looking at Havoc Burning Impact and uh, Havoc Burning Pact and Body Slam. All three of these cards are cards which will show up in winning Ironclad decks all the time, but all three of them are quite difficult to put into your deck early in the game. 
Body Slam is a card which improves immensely when upgraded. It starts to become zero energy cost, which is a big deal for Ironclad, because Ironclad has generally expensive cards. But um, we have a Bash to upgrade, we have a Clothesline to upgrade, we don't have unlimited campfires, so getting it upgraded is not reasonable in Act 1, really. And early in the game, unless you've picked up like a Shrug It Off or a Flame Barrier, you're just not going to be generating enough block in your turns for Body Slam to be great damage. So I had a run today where I picked up a Body Slam very early and did upgrade it, but in general, it's not something that I get to do. I love doing it when I can, but it's not usually something that, you know, has enough value compared to the other things which you could be doing. Burning Pact. Card draw is something that becomes much, much more valuable later in the game, and so is targeted exhaust. So these are two effects which are very powerful for boss fights. They're very powerful in a deck with, you know, 30 plus cards with a bunch of powers or other things which it wants to get set up as it goes through its um, goes through all of its cards the first time in a fight. It's not nearly as valuable in hallway fights. It's not nearly as valuable early in the game. So Burning Pact is something that, yeah, we'll be looking out for that maybe in the second half of the run, but not so excited about it right now. And then Havoc. Havoc is an incredible card when upgraded, or an incredible card when hitting exhaust synergies, but neither of these things are happening. When upgraded, Havoc is zero cost. So... Maybe I should just be looping the same track. <laughs> um, when upgraded, Havoc is zero cost, so it just gets us another card played every turn that we draw it, basically. Ironclad is... A class which very rarely manages to play all of the cards in its hand, at least in the first act, before you have an energy relic. So, yeah, Havoc, Havoc would be great if it were upgraded, but it's not. And we don't have any exhaust energies for it yet, so this ends up being a skip, despite having three reasonable cards on offer. Trying to work out whether we're going to fights or question marks and whether we want to be ready to fight elites or what have you. This event is just a pretty clear plus 5 max HP, I believe. The heal is only hitting for 20, not 25, and max HP is quite valuable on Ironclad. There are a lot of ways that max HP can be very valuable on Ironclad. The more sustain available to your character, the better max HP will tend to be because you're more likely to actually be able to get up to max HP. And also because if you take like 50 damage in a fight, it doesn't necessarily end your run. So if you have 50 max HP, taking 50 damage in a fight is going to end your run, obviously, because you'll die. If you have 80 max HP and low sustain, taking 50 damage in a fight is likely ending your run anyway, because you'll take some more damage in the next fight and just be dead. But Ironclad has um, the ability to get enough max HP to take a bunch of damage and the ability to get enough sustain to get that back. And so having a big max HP pool on Ironclad is great. Ironclad can also end up with some inconsistent decks, so you'll just take some damage in some fights and not take damage in other fights. Lots of reasons to like max HP on Ironclad. It's a super easy slam fight, don't believe we took damage there. And we're looking at Carnage, Heavy Blade, and Pommel Strike. I assume that Past Steven took Carnage here, but I'm not certain. Um... So Carnage is just like a better version of Heavy Blade right now. There could be a point at some time in the run where Heavy Blade did more damage than Carnage, but it definitely isn't right now. We have no access to strength at all. Carnage is a good upgrade. It upgrades dealing 28 damage. It's just a lot of damage early. The only reason I could see not to take Carnage here is that we already added a clothesline, so it would be three two-cost cards, which means we're regularly going to fail to play, um, play them as we go through the deck. But I believe we take Carnage. Carnage is just like a better version of Pommel Strike. Pommel Strike's a way to deal a little bit of extra damage while uh, getting more cards to spend our energy on. And Carnage just deals damage more efficiently than Pommel Strike. And it gives us more stuff to spend energy on too, because it costs two. So I think Carnage sort of dominates Pommel Strike a little bit in this situation. I did decide to skip. Hmm. Okay, I don't hate skipping. I guess I decided... Oh, I don't have any upgrades yet. Yeah. The fact that I didn't have a Bash or Clothesline upgrade yet makes skipping a little bit better, I think, because I do want to upgrade Bash and Clothesline and Carnage if I'm putting Carnage in the deck as well. This ends up being a Lagavulin fight. Um, 
just passed turn one to try to get Ascender's Bane out of the deck before we started actually playing. And... I don't know. Maybe it was better to bash turn one. I also drew bash and clothesline in the same hand, which is not great. We wanted to have clothesline available for the turns where we were getting attacked. Why did I go for a strike there instead of a defend? Man, I'm really, uh... <laughs> Really not defending in this fight. I guess I was concerned about the fact that I have no potions and very little in the way of increased damage output, which is reasonable, because I really don't have those things. Alright. So. Rest of the way through the fight, we're blocking a little bit. In general against Lagavulin, you want to try to line up your damage so you kill after the turn that you where you get siphoned, because I just spent three energy on attacks without being attacked. Now I get another three energy that I can spend on attacks without being attacked. So you end up very efficiently dealing damage for two turns, and that's usually the moment where you want to kill stuff. Looking at dual wield. Fire Breathing and Anger. Fire Breathing is, I think, the uh, ubiquitously agreed upon worst card in Ironclad. Just, it's a power which only deals damage and doesn't deal very much damage. And it also is a power which only deals damage if you're playing lots of attacks in a turn. And if you're playing a controlling deck which tries to abuse powers, you probably aren't playing a ton of attacks a turn. So Fire Breathing is just a bad card for the most part. Um, it's one of the few cards in the game where I don't think it has redeeming quality. Uh, the only time that it ever comes up is like, what if I have some crazy combo deck that can play a ton of attacks a turn? And the answer is like, you don't want fire breathing in it. You have a crazy combo deck that can play a ton of attacks a turn. That's what you should focus on. Why would you want fire breathing in that deck? How does that help? How does that help you play tons of attacks a turn? If your combo deck is trying to play tons of attacks a turn, put cards in it that help it play tons of attacks a turn. Don't put cards in it that like deal 10 damage. <laughs> or whatever fire breathing would do. Dual wield is a like weird combo enabling card which sometimes has value and um it's very inconsistent. Ironclad doesn't have a great many ways to guarantee that you draw dual wield with the stuff that you want to be copying, but you can put together decks which scale off something like metallicize and a dual wield and you just dual wield metallicize over and over again and put it in play. But that's a long way down the line. So the question is just whether or not we put Anger in our deck here. Anger is generally a fine Ironclad card. It's something I just love to have one of in pretty much any deck. It will get us extra damage on the first and second cycles through the deck without really changing the composition of the deck at all. Um, Ironclad very rarely, as I've been saying, manages to play all of their cards in the first act. So having a card in your hand which costs zero that's just an extra card that you're playing that turn. It has slight drawbacks in the if I need to draw a defend on a turn or something and I draw anger instead, that was one less card that I drew that could have been a defend. But it makes up for that by just dealing good damage. And Ironclad has a bunch of strength scaling. Ironclad has a vulnerable. Ironclad currently has a pen nib in the relic bar. So there are lots of reasons to care about being able to play cheap attacks. Um, anger deals five damage, but it's going to end up dealing more damage than that. A lot of the time. So, Anger I think is a clear pick and I'm pretty sure that I did take Anger. Talking to subs, talking to subs. Alright. So we grab an Anger. We're pretty low health because of the lag of villain fight and now I'm trying to work out, you know, am I just going to the stores or am I taking elites? I think it ends up being pretty clear that we take the right path from the treasure node to go to stores from this point. It's just we have no potions, our deck doesn't really do very much, we have to get stronger to actually be able to fight the act boss, and with 400 gold we're more able to do that by going to a store than we are able to do it by fighting elites and taking a few hallway fights. So, I think heading toward the stores is a clear thing, and if the store, if the first store doesn't have enough for us to kill the elite in it, we just go to the second store and keep looking. We're fighting against the Guardian, so the Guardian is the easiest Act 1 boss, but unless we can like block for 20 every turn, or find some way to um, debuff him, he does have some threat to us. Let's keep the 
ahead, skip ahead, skip ahead. All right, we have killed two lice. We're looking at Entrench, Soul, and Sentinel. So, these cards are all trash, basically, I think, is the short version of what I want to say. Um, Sentinel and Entrench are both cards which can be quite strong in the right deck, but awkwardly, to get to a point where you have the right deck for Entrench or Sentinel, you usually have to already reach a point where your deck is very good. It's hard to put Entrench or Sentinel into a deck which has like a 50-50 chance of winning the run right now. Um, if you put Entrench or Sentinel into a deck, your deck probably already was at least 95% likely to win the run. Because for you to have enough exhaust synergies for Sentinel to be good, like your deck is already good at that point. Almost certainly your deck's already good. If you have a deck where Entrench is good, you likely like already have a barricade and some good block cards. And generally, if your deck has a barricade and some good block cards, your deck was already good. Um, I can think of a few situations where I put these cards in my decks where the deck wasn't already incredible. In particular, there was a Corruption run I played where I had Feel No Pains but no Barricade, and the only way I could really win was to burst out a ton of block in one turn and then body slam the enemy to death. So I like killed Time Eater by making 120 block one turn and then body slamming three times. Um, so like, yeah, it's possible, but it's very, very unusual. I'm just trying to stress that these are cards which are um, sort of... They go into certain decks which are already strong and have a little bit of value in them, but in general, I don't think they're very valuable cards, and I would not recommend taking them in general. Sever Soul just deals some damage and exhausts some stuff, but it's not very exciting. It's just like a card that bloats our deck. It has no great value in terms of exhaust synergies for us. It doesn't help our deck in any other way, so not worth having. Upgrading two random cards for 24 HP is well worth it. Don't really have to think about that. Upgrades are not so different from each other on Ironclad that you could ever really want one upgrade instead of two. And basically, at worst, what that event does is force you to rest instead of upgrade. And there just aren't upgrades in Ironclad that are more valuable than two random upgrades to your deck, I don't think. You'd have to be in a very specific sort of situation for that to be the case. All right, hold on, Steven. Hold on, hold on. Let's look at this store. So we're walking into this Guardian fight. We need some scaling for the Guardian or some ability to consistently make 20 block a turn. So there's no Metallicize here. There's no Disarm here. Disarm makes a ton of block against Guardian, makes a ton of mitigation against Guardian. Um, there's no ability to do that. And so because of that, we're sort of going to be racing Guardian. We're not going to be able to block for as much as we're getting attacked for. And we have to make the decision of, you know, can we do that? Can we beat Guardian by doing that? And does it leave us in a winnable position in Act 2? Or do we have to go to the next store and look for something else? And this is like not a question that you can answer without having played the game before. There's no reason that you could go into this store and make this decision without already having experience with what is coming up. So just sort of a trial by error and learning a bunch. But I'm pretty confident that we win with a spot weakness against Guardian, and I'm also quite confident that our deck can use that spot weakness to scale beneficially in Act 2. Um, the elite fights in Act 2 are all good for spot weakness. The only time in Act 2 that you're in an elite fight where spot weakness doesn't work is if you're specifically against Gremlin Leader and he doesn't have any Gremlins who are attacking you and he's not attacking you. But in general, spot weakness is really good in Act 2 elite fights, which are, you know, a scary thing which we'd like to be able to defeat. Um, spot weakness is pretty good against the Guardian. Another thing about our deck right now is that we haven't picked up a single block card yet. We picked up a clothesline and an anger, and other than that, we have the starter deck. And so it would be really lovely to be able to block more. And the fact that we can't block more is why this run is so unique. Um, we continue not being able to block more for quite a while here and have to get pretty creative to deal with stuff. 
The only thing in the store that really helps us in our pursuit of being able to block is Toxic Egg. Toxic Egg will upgrade any skill that we pick up, and generally speaking, the stuff that blocks for you in Ironclad is um, skills. So if we do see some block cards, Toxic Egg is going to make them better and more rapidly address the problem that our deck has where it's not blocking. So that ends up being 333 gold, which is slightly too much for us to card remove as well. But if we're going to buy Spot Weakness and Toxic Egg, yeah, I don't think there's, there's anything really wrong with that. No reason to buy an Exhume. I believe I bought a Block Potion here. Get us a little bit more safety against the Guardian. Sort of like buying half a rest or something right now for 50 gold, which I'm happy to do. And I guess I thought that I was in an okay enough position to take two fights to try to improve the deck further. Which is not that unreasonable. If we pick up like a Disarm in one of these fights, or we have a Toxic Egg now, so if we pick up any good skill, that could make a big difference to the Guardian fight. I'm just going to skip through this. If you guys want to see me play combats, I mean, I've played these combats hundreds of times on stream, and I do it live for several hours a day. This is a moment where I can talk in more depth about the card decisions and the general shape of the run, so that's more what I'm interested in here. I think we took like two damage net in that fight, and we're looking at... Oh, whoops. <laughs> we're looking at Pommel Strike, Whirlwind, or a Havoc Plus. Whirlwind's a pretty bad card when not upgraded, unless you have very reliable early strength or something like that. Whirlwind is not a very good card when it isn't upgraded. Another thing about X cost cards is they're a way to put all of your energy into a specific thing on the turn where you draw them. And if you're bad at putting all of your energy into that specific thing in general, an X cost card goes way up in value. So Whirlwind goes much higher in value if you have a deck which is block heavy and doesn't have a lot of attacks in it because it gives you the option to deal a ton of damage on the turn where you drew it and you don't have like a bunch of attacks in your hand that could have done that anyway. Reinforced Body for Defect is a card which gives you 7 and block for X times and costs X energy. And that card's a lot more valuable on a Defect deck that has a lot of attacks in it than it is in a Defect deck which has a lot of blocks in it for the same reason. When you draw it, it gives you the chance to spend all of your energy on block that turn. If your deck was already very block heavy, that chance isn't very valuable to you, really. You already had that ability with the other cards in your hand. So Whirlwind's not great here. I don't think there's too much to say about that other than what I've said. I feel like people get really excited about Whirlwind and what it does, and it can do combo things, and it can be a speedrun card and stuff, and that's like very cool, but down in the trenches in Ascension 15, Whirlwind is usually, you know, moderate, moderate value at best. And this deck is extremely attack heavy, so it's certainly not a good card in this deck. Pommel Strike's okay, Havoc Plus is okay. I'm curious what I took. Probably a Havoc Plus, I'm guessing. Gotta be a little bit careful with Havoc Plus in this deck. I can't exhaust Spot Weakness against Guardian or I die. But um, for all the reasons that I was talking about earlier in the act, Havoc Plus is a good card here. You just saw it played a two energy attack for us this turn. That's an extra two energy worth of damage that we don't have without putting that card into our deck. Although it did um, show up in a hand which didn't have enough block in it to block fully. So, you know, maybe if we didn't have it, we would have drawn a block card instead. Looking at the next hand, we see that no, actually we wouldn't have, but there's no way to know that in advance. And our next card choices between Flex Plus, Thunderclap, and Hemokinesis. Flex Plus is a... Flex Plus is a card that I think if you're going to analyze in parallel, you could look at Anger and a decent amount of the time that's going to give you some value. Um, Anger is a card that costs zero. It's an attack and it deals five damage for you when you draw it. And Anger is like fine it's not exciting but it's okay flex plus is a skill 
which means that it's much worse against Gremlin Nod and <laughs> Gremlin Nod, uh, Gremlin Nob and the Chosen. So those are a couple of downsides. Um, it also doesn't do anything unless you draw attacks with it. Like you have to draw attacks and flex at the same time, and so that adds a, a fairly large chunk of unreliability to the card. I don't think flex would be terrible to take here because our deck is so immensely attack heavy. You're going to regularly draw it with two or three attacks, which you're playing this turn, and it's going to deal, you know, eight or 12 damage just by itself. We are very desperately trying to make our deck not attack heavy anymore, though. And so I'm not super interested in picking it up. We also don't have any card draw yet. Flex would go up in value if we had card draw. Flex is an unusual card for me to be picking, and because of these unique circumstances, I'm like sort of thinking about picking a flex plus, but if my deck had more blocks in it and this wasn't a flex plus, I would basically never even consider picking it. Thunderclap is another attack. It applies one vulnerable to all enemies. It's AoE. It's just like a mediocre attack card. I don't think much other than that of it. <laughs> and Hemokinesis... Um, Hemokinesis is a very good front-loaded damage card if you can get it early, and upgrading it is a big deal because it makes you lose 2 HP instead of 3, which adds up massively. Um, and 18 damage instead of 14 damage is a big deal too. But we're not going to be able to upgrade it right now. So none of these are quite making the cut for the deck. And, I mean, the general theme is that we're trying to make it so our deck can block and adding more cards that only attack to our deck takes us further away from achieving that. Because that's, you know... If we want to get it to a point where, say, half of our cards have block written on them or something, then every card that doesn't have block written on them means that we're further away from that goal. Gotta rest here. Don't upgrade, Steven. Rest. Yep. <laughs> There's no way that we beat the Guardian with 25 HP. There's absolutely no way. And we get a Guardian fight. So I, I massively misplayed this turn one, I still remember. No, it's turn two that I misplay. Skip ahead. So we have to deal 28 damage, and for some reason my brain just like exploded, and I thought with Bash Havoc there was a chance that I could. But I only have three energy. I don't have four energy. Maybe I thought Happy Flower was going. Uh, we missed regardless. And I probably thought that Happy Flower was going, actually. Sometimes, like, sometimes I'm not entirely sure why my brain is sabotaging my run, but that's that's an explanation that makes sense. Maybe I thought that Happy Flower was on. All right, so anyway, we take a bunch of damage. We're on 18 health. That causes the fight to be quite touch and go, and this fight goes for a while. It's definitely not an easy fight. I think that other than that turn one, I played it quite well. I didn't miss any pen nibs. I didn't... Yeah, I didn't, like, have any plays that I was particularly upset about from that point. This is sort of fascinating, isn't it? It doesn't look like it's possible that we win from here. <laughs> oh. But yeah, managed to turn it around with a steroid potion to block some extra. Dealt enough damage here to transform him this turn causing the attack not to happen. And then I just had to draw a block card to not kill myself when I attacked the shell form on the next turn. And we did hit with actually the last draw. <laughs> so that was a really, really, really close fight. Um, contributed somewhat to the tone of the run, I would say, how close that Guardian fight ended up being. Certainly glad that I rested. Um, yeah, I think that I did a fairly good job of identifying exactly how much was required to win that fight, and then completely ruined how to play the second turn, and managed to get through it anyway. So, our options are Limit Break Plus, Berserk, and Offering Plus. Limit Break Plus is a great card to have. It's very good at killing bosses. You sort of would like to have some way for your deck to gain the first point of strength before you put it in your deck. We do have a spot weakness, but it's not reliable in hallway fights, and boss fights are a long way away. So 
Limit Break is like worth mentioning, but not something we're gonna pick here. Berserk, I think, is a terrible card. Um, Berserk doesn't generate any value for you until uh, two turns after you draw and play it, your minus one card plus one energy. Two turns after you draw and play it. On the turn that you draw and play Berserk, your minus one card, minus one energy. The next turn, your minus one card, net neutral energy. And the turn after that, your minus one card, plus one energy. So depending on how much you value a card drawn, you you might be ahead two turns after you play Berserk. It's a card which can have some value in boss fights, but in general, this card is very bad in my opinion. So, also, it doesn't even do anything unless you're below 50% HP. There is no reason for that card to have a requirement that you be below 50% HP. It would not be a very good card if it did not have that requirement. Alright, so yeah, we just take Offering Plus. Offering is probably the strongest card in the game. and We put it in our deck here. Offering is so strong that you don't really need an Energy Relic anymore. Especially, we have an Anger and a Havoc Plus, too. If we go three turns in a fight um, in Act 2, we end up averaging four energy if we play our offering in that fight. And we have a Happy Flower as well. So we're averaging four energy in a lot of fights um, without even having a fourth energy relic, which is very nice. Ironclad can definitely use four energy, can definitely use five energy, but we don't have the option here. So. Our choices are to do something sort of fancy with Runic Pyramid. Runic Pyramid makes us draw one less card every turn, but we don't have to discard our hand at the end of the turn. Um, Runic Pyramid can work okay with Ironclad. It's got some synergy with Fiendfire. It's got some synergy with a card like Whirlwind because Whirlwind doesn't require you to draw as many cards to spend all of your energy. It has synergy with something like dual wield. We can guarantee that dual wield and metallicize get drawn together if we want to duplicate a bunch of metallicizes. Yeah, it can be all right in Ironclad. There are lots of ways that being able to retain your hand can improve the consistency of your deck a lot and let you do cool things and powerful things. But we don't have any of those things in our deck right now. So there is a Unfortunately, much reason to take a Runic Pyramid here, unless there's literally nothing else that we can think about taking, in which case, maybe it would be better than skipping. Maybe, but not necessarily, because drawing one less card every turn is a very big deal. Drawing cards is important in this game. So our options are Black Star to give us two relics for killing elites, which is not something we're very excited to do right now, because our deck doesn't have any ability to kill elites right now in Act 2. Um, we're on three energy. We haven't really improved our deck much at all. The only thing it's really got going for it is the spot weakness in the offering. Or there's a Pandora's box. Pandora's box will transform all of our strikes and defends into other things. Unfortunately, we've upgraded two of the strikes, but hey, that's fine. Uh, we do have a Toxic Egg, which improves the value of Pandora's box because any skills that we transform into are going to be automatically upgraded. And... You know, the fact that we're getting rid of our four only defense doesn't really matter that much because it's not like they were letting us block anyway. If your deck can't block incoming damage, there is a tipping point where you start only caring about being able to kill the enemy as quickly as possible. And being able to block like 5 out of 20 damage in a turn isn't actually that important at all compared to ending the fight one turn faster. So... Defend is not a very good card in Ironclad. Defend Plus is a much better card than Defend in Ironclad, in my experience, because that 8 block... I don't know, it's a lot more than 5 block. So, we're going for our Pandora's box. Click on it, Steven. Playing for the crowd. Unbelievable. Alright, and here it is. <laughs> We've gotten a Headbutt, a Fire Breathing. Hey, that card's terrible. Battle Trance, Heavy Blade, Battle Trance, Metallicize, Rupture, Havoc, and Inflame. And the two Battle Trances and the Havoc are all upgraded. So there's some really strong stuff going on with what we've just gotten. We've gotten two Battle Trances. Battle Trance, one of the strongest Ironclad on commons. Ironclad struggles a little bit with card draw, and Battle Trance solves all of your card draw problems all by itself, basically. I have red guides in my life, which have said to only take one Battle Trance in a deck, because 
there is some anti-synergy there. You draw cards and cannot draw any additional cards this turn. So if you play a battle trance and draw a bunch of cards and one of them is another battle trance, you're not going to be able to draw other cards with the other battle trance. Um, saying that you should only have one battle trance in your deck like makes my brain fall out of my skull. It is so stupid. No offense to people who have said that. I understand the reasoning because like there is that anti-synergy, right? But like... I would take four battle trances in this deck probably and not be upset about it. Um, and this deck currently only has, what, 16 cards in it? So like on average I'd draw two a turn. But also on average I would be drawing um, seven other cards every turn. Which is more than the five cards I draw per turn right now. So battle trances are really, really, really strong. Very happy to have two of those. We got another Havoc Plus, which means that along with all of our card draw, we have two copies of Havoc Plus and one copy of Anger. So we've got three zero-cost things that we can be playing constantly. We've got a Headbutt. Headbutt's a really nice synergistic card with Havoc in particular, because it lets us place a card from our discard pile on top of our draw pile, and then Havoc plays the top card of our draw pile. So it gives us some ability to select what card Havoc is hitting which can be valuable either to exhaust the cards that we don't want in a fight that's going to go longer, or to replay cards that we need to play straight away in a, in a fight that's not taking as long. So for example, this Heavy Blade that we just picked up, if we get an Inflame in play and play a spot weakness, we've got 6 strength, Heavy Blade all of a sudden is dealing 30 damage. We may want to Heavy Blade, then Headbutt the Heavy Blade on top, and then Havoc, and that turn is going to deal um, 75 damage by itself for three energy in this situation where we've played in flame and spot weakness once. So, you know, that's a really, really nice thing to have. Rupture will make us a strength right now if we play it before offering, that's like so-so. Metallicize is actually the only card in the entire deck that can make any block right now, which is <laughs> a fun thing. Fire breathing's shit, yeah. So the deck's really fast right now. It kills things very, 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 very rapidly. Here's a look at the deck as a whole as we go into Act 2. Stuff is going to die if we attack it. On the other hand, we cannot block. Uh, if we are still unable to block when we reach the Hyper Beam boss fight at the end of this act, we will just die. If we get um, Holy Fights with a lot of HP in them, which hit us for damage, we will take a lot of damage. If we fight elites and draw poorly and don't manage to burst them with damage very well, um, we may die or failing that will take a lot of damage. So I'm not opposed to taking elite fights with this deck in Act 2. I think it's actually quite a strong Act 2 deck right now, but it has a very unique problems which are going to have to be solved by either finding some way to block at some point in our life, or getting so ridiculously good at attacking <laughs> that we just never have to block. Um, and, you know, one of those is considerably more likely than the other. I'm going to speed through this one a little bit. This ends up ending on turn 2 or 3 or something, I think. That was turn 1. And then turn 2... This is with Penib. Okay, he's on three after turn two. So it took us three turns to deal 100 plus damage. And our card selection is between Sword Boomerang, Evolve, and Flex Plus. Sorry that I was skipping around like a crazy person there. Um. Sword Boomerang is the second strength scaling attack that would be able to put in our deck. We already have a Heavy Blade, which is scaling pretty well with strength. It would be a way to go more all-in on strength scaling for damage. Evolve doesn't have any particular um, synergies with anything in our deck right now. It's a good card in general. There are a lot of fights where statuses get put in your deck by somebody else, so even if your deck isn't generating statuses for itself, it's generally drawing you cards pretty nicely in a lot of fights. Um, but it's like, I mean, it's not good enough to put in your deck right now <laughs> for that reason. Our deck is immensely good at drawing cards already. And 
in a lot of fights, it's just going to be dead. There's no no good reason to put an evolve in the deck right now, I don't think. Um, Flex Plus. I talked about Flex Plus at the end of Act 1, looking at it. And the reasons I wasn't interested in it were that I didn't have enough card draw for it, mostly. And that I was trying to learn how to block with my deck, and it was going to get in the way of teaching me to block. Uh, neither of those things are quite as true anymore. Like, yeah, I still want to be able to block, but in this exact moment, that's not what I'm trying to do. In this exact moment, I'm trying to kill things before they can hurt me, because I can't block right now. And when we're past the point of the game where you really get to learn how to do things and not worry about what you're actually achieving, well, we've definitely reached the game where your deck has to actually be achieving something. Act 2 hallway fights are terrifying, Act 2 elite fights are terrifying, the Act 2 boss fight is legitimately terrifying so we need our deck to be better at what it does and flex plus makes our deck better at what it does this is the only time i can remember in the last like 100 ironclad runs where i've voluntarily put a flex plus in my deck like other than like transforming into a flex or something i just do not often feel the need for this card but this is definitely a moment where it's okay you can go all the way back to taking the max HP on Ironclad at that event in Act 1 when you're looking at a pick like this, because adding a flex to this deck makes the deck less consistent for the rest of the run. It is a combo type card where we will have turns in the rest of the run where flex gets drawn and is terrible. Um, this turn, for example, the first time that we draw it, <laughs> flex gets drawn in a hand where we have one energy floated at the end of the turn and all it does is deal four damage. So <laughs> it didn't get off to a great start, but we do have a bit of extra HP. Um, being able to use our HP to tank damage from those bad turns helps us out a lot. Did we go Heavy Blade, Headbutt, Heavy Blade here? We've got two Havocs. There's an Offering in our draw pile. There are only three cards in the draw pile. One thing that was fascinating about this deck was how difficult it was to play fights. And if you want to check out the VOD of it, uh, this is from May the 25th. It's the first run of the uh, three hour, 47 minute and 28 second long VOD from May the 25th on my Twitch channel. Yeah, some of these fights were very interesting to navigate because we're just trying to kill stuff as quickly as possible for the most part. We only have a Metallicize to block with, so it becomes about trying to optimize exclusively for damage, which is a bit more fun than optimizing exclusively for block because if you're optimizing exclusively for block, if you get to a point where you already have enough block your optimization doesn't matter anymore when you're optimizing exclusively for damage only the last turn of the entire fight can you ever be in a situation where you have enough damage did i play metallicize here yes okay so we get an attack potion which is sort of cool we're looking at Entrench plus Wild Strike and Headbutt. Wild Strike is a little bit more damage. Headbutt is a little bit more Havoc Synergy. Entrench plus... This is actually the second Entrench that we've seen in the run. <laughs> and it would double our current block. It's just unfortunate that our current block is always zero. So it makes it a pretty bad card. Because we are looking for cards which make us better at blocking. But Entrench is definitely not one of them right now. Um, in general, I don't think Wild Strike or Headbutt add enough to the deck to put them into the deck and water down the density of Offering slash Battle Trance. Offerings and Battle Trances are what we want our deck to be composed of um, most heavily in order to get stuff killed. So this ends up just being a skip. And we head to an event and get offered a Relic for 85 gold. I assume that we say yes to that, and we get a war paint. Yeah, so war paint upgrades two skills in your deck. We don't have any skills that aren't upgraded in our deck. Yeah, sell it, Steven. Sell it. Fix your green screen. Idiot. All right. <laughs> I was not very pleased when I got that war paint. I think, uh, I think somewhat reasonably so.
gosh. Yeah, I, I'm not going to be able to talk about all of these fights. This is like something that I do live a lot more than I do in retrospect. It's much harder for me to talk about the fights in retrospect because I can't look at the draw pile or my deck or something when I want to, and I don't know exactly what I'm thinking as I like play the hands. So it's a little bit harder for me to predict what I'm doing. But in general, we're just trying to kill the guys, right? It's not like it's not like it's that complicated. See, we kill them. We have a pen nib, so we try to play the attack that hits for the most when our pen nib is up. We try to leave combats with some stacks on our pen nib so that we can, uh, so that we can, you know, play a high damage attack fairly early on into the next combat. And get offered to shrug it off plus demon form and clothesline. So clothesline's a great early game card, not as great to pick up later on in the game. Um, if you don't have a source of weak in your deck yet, clothesline is, I think, worth picking up at any point in the entire run, always. But usually you can pick up a Shockwave or a... or you'll already have a Closeline for Act 1, or you'll pick up an Uppercut perhaps, which is like a... It's, at least when upgraded, Uppercut is sort of a better version of Closeline slash Bash. Yeah, I'm not going to put another Closeline in our deck right now though. Demon Form is an extremely powerful card. It is a centerpiece of many winning ironclad decks. Any deck which is good at creating mitigation can put a demon form in it and win the run. Like, I. Yeah, it's strong enough for that general claim to be true. You don't have to, like, be playing a particular. A very. Yeah, you don't have to be playing any sort of particular strategy, really. If your deck can block for as much as you get attacked for consistently, then putting a demon form in your deck wins you the run. Um, it's just that simple. You just play the demon form, and then you block, and then you attack twice. You don't need to have any particular attacks. You can use your basic strikes. Um, generally speaking, you are going to be choosing between like maximizing your ability to block, in which case you actually probably want to be taking attacks out of your deck more than putting attacks into your deck, or you want to be maximizing your ability to sort of use your max HP plus scaling to kill something on like turn six or seven, in which case something like a heavy blade or a sword boomerang is quite nice to have in your demon form deck. But in general, do in general demon form is very strong with decks which can block a lot, which we can't do. So it's not even close to being considered here. Shrug it off plus is the exact card that we want. Shrug it off is one of the best ironclad commons. Maybe the best ironclad common in general. I don't know. True Grit's pretty good. Has to be True Grit plus though. Hmm. I haven't thought about this for a while. Anyway, Shrug it off is incredibly, incredibly good. And it blocks for us. So hold on. I need to see that fist pump. That's not a. F <laughs> <laughs> Who is this guy? I think I would watch this guy's show. That was fun. Alright. <laughs> we get, um, we're at 41 health. We're forced into an elite fight on the next floor. I actually... Elite fights are often, like, easier in Act 2 than hallway fights are. For a lot of decks, elite fights end up dealing you less damage than a hallway fight could. Um... This is a deck which takes a lot of damage against Gremlin Leader, I think, but against the other elites, it does pretty well. Book of Stabbing deals some damage to it. Slavers aren't too bad. Eh, this deck sort of sucks against all the elites, I've decided. Uh, but we decided we wanted an elite fight. We want to get over to this campfire. We don't want to take a ton of hallway fights. We want events. And we get offered this book. Costs us 21 HP on Ascension 15 to acquire one of three books. Necronomicon would be incredibly good, but Enchiridion and Nilri's Codex are a little bit iffy in our deck right now. Enchiridion gives us a free power every fight, which just often doesn't have that much value, and Nilri's Codex gives us a choice between three cards every turn, which is very, 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 very good. Um, but better if fights go longer for your deck, and also better if you can block in your deck. So you can make use of the ability to like get a Reaper or a Feed in a fight by just waiting until it shows up. We can't do that. We can't go to 20 health and then walk into an elite fight with our potions. So with our potions and our deck. 
So, just not doing that. I think I should spot weakness headbutt there. Shouldn't I? Yeah, I should spot weakness headbutt there. Probably. Is that true? Probably. Alright, uh, that would have been a better play than what I did. Would it, though? Hmm. I'm not sure now. <laughs> Maybe it would have been a better player than what I did. It doesn't get us as deep into the deck. And drawing further into the deck draws a sword, shrug it off, plus and metallicize, which is really valuable, and we can just headbutt to spot weakness next turn. Yeah, I'm not sure. It seems close. If I don't headbutt spot weakness here, though... Well, okay, I ran out of cards. Huh. This fight's been really interesting for me to watch. I am left unsure of what I was meant to do exactly. Unfortunately, we didn't have quite enough damage to kill with close on there. Yeah, I guess the other thing is that Pendib's coming, so we don't really need to spot weakness twice in this fight. Hmm. In the end, we didn't actually take enough damage to kill us if we had taken the book, so hindsight's 2020. but... Maybe I just was never planning to spot weakness twice in the fight. Me, I... It's really hard for me, like, post-fact, to look back and I'm not actually playing the fights with the deck and I have a pretty good analytical idea of what it does, but I'm not sort of in the zone quite as well, so... I don't know. Could do math on that and find out. Definitely the result was quite good for us. Whatever. We're looking at a Burning Pack plus Anger plus and Wild Strike plus. We just picked up a Molten Egg as a reward for this fight. Um, Burning Pack plus isn't that unreasonable to pick up. We're not going to take another copy of Anger, I don't think. We're not going to take a Wild Strike plus. But Burning Pack plus is nice. It's our first ability to groom the deck for like the boss fight at the end of the act. I would have liked taking that, I think. I think that I think my deck is worse than it actually is right now. Like, Past even thinks that the deck is worse than it is at the moment. I think that we can take Burning Pact, and that gives us almost a guaranteed win against Hyper Beam Fight, because it lets us spot weakness on the turns that we want to much more consistently. And it also lets us get rid of the Chaff attacks uh, and get our Shrug it off to a point where it's a larger part of the deck. And that's, like, all of the above is a pretty big deal. Alright, let's skip through this fight. I remember this fight. We, like, killed them pretty rapidly once stuff started going. The deck's really fun to play. There are all these, like, Havocs and free cards and strength gain and... And then everything dies. So we're still doing alright. And we're looking at an Infernal Blade plus Pommel Strike plus and a Thunderclap plus. Um, I don't hate Infernal Blade plus or Pommel Strike plus here. I'm curious what I took. Infernal Blade plus. I think we care more about getting more output right now than we do about hard draw. We still have the two battle trances, which are doing a pretty good job of drawing cards for us every turn. Ooh, but Pommel Strike interacts well with Headbutt. We can, like, Headbutt and then Pommel Strike to spot weakness. This seems really close. 
Okay, we went for the pommel strike. I don't think that's wrong. I'm gonna just go ahead and trust the version of Steven who was in the middle of playing this run and say that, yeah, I think that Pommel Strike and Infernal Blade both seem, both seem pretty good there as ways to just deal more damage. You got a pretty bad hand here on turn one against Slavers. But I guess we have Pendov, so do we just kill the guy straight away? We just killed the back guy on turn one anyway, right? Yeah, didn't even matter how bad our hand was. And from here, we're just like pretty much good. We have 10 strength for some reason. <laughs> and they're all dead. All right. We get a Shrug It Off Plus, Demon Form, and Dual Wield Plus. I've talked about all of these cards already in this run, so I'm not going to rehash that. I think it should be pretty easy to tell why Shrug It Off Plus is better. I'm going to start um, speeding through the run a little bit more now. Because on the 30th floor, in my opinion, it's quite rare for a run to hold together more than past the 30th floor in this game. If you need help fighting against the Act 2 boss, then sometimes the run stays very interesting all the way through Act 2. But Act 3, very commonly, your deck already knows what it's doing, already knows how it's beating the final boss, and you're just sort of going through the motions. And this deck... Um, Ooh, actually, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. This deck has a good Act 3, actually. Yeah, I guess this deck has a good Act 3. Maybe this won't actually speed up that much. Um, fellow Witness, why don't you bet on who you think will emerge victorious? This is a pet peeve of mine, and I just want to talk about this. So, bet 50 gold, 70% chance to win 100 gold. Bet 50 gold, 30% chance to win 250 gold. So, like, everyone who's taken one statistics class or whatever works out how expected value works here, right? So you multiply 100 by 0.7 and get the, your expected 70 gold. Or you multiply 250 by 0.3 and work out that you expected 75 gold. Um, and you work out that 75 is more than 70, so you're like, yeah, you should bet on the owner because it has more expected value. Um, in like The next step, though, is that you have to think about game theory and what value is in this game because gold isn't value in this game gold is gold in this game value in this game is winning the run and your chance to win the run is the value that you care about and um different amounts of gold change your chance to win the run by different amounts so if i bet on owner and win here i end up having 385 gold and i go to a store 385 golds enough to like buy any relic in the game and card remove or something and that happens 30 percent of the time i can buy any relic in the game and card remove or something like that um however if i lose i have 135 gold i can't get a relic so 30 percent of the time i can buy any relic in the game and card remove but 70 percent of the time i don't even have enough gold to buy a relic and that's way more impactful on my chance to win the run than like the expectation of gold is whether or not I get to buy that relic, basically. Because relics are important. And we're going to a boss fight, which is not guaranteed to be a win for us yet. Like, this store is going to matter. If I bet on the murderer, then yeah, I have slightly less expected average gold at the end. But 70% of the time, I can buy any relic in the game when I go to the store. Um, that's better. <laughs> That's better than only being able to buy any relic in the game 30% of the time. So you have to like contextually try to work out how much value different things have. It's like going into a chess game and seeing that one sequence of moves leaves you having one more pawn than the other player and thinking that therefore that is clearly the best sequence of moves when it's obvious to anyone who's played chess much at all that if you go through a sequence of moves and end up with one pawn more than the other player, but you've completely decimated your entire position in the game and are now like about to get checkmated, that wasn't actually a good idea. It's not the right, like, that's not the right value. Your value in chess is your chance to win the game, not how many pawns you have. All right. Rant over. So we have 235 gold. This wouldn't be enough gold to buy any relic in the game if we didn't have courier, by the way. But we do have courier, so store prices are reduced. There are some rare relics which we can't uh, afford, but in general, in general, this is enough money. 
And this is a very, very difficult star, actually. So, Fianlo Pain's immensely powerful, but I don't believe we have any way to reliably exhaust things. This goes back to that Burning Pact pick, which we decided not to take the Burning Pact in. I think we should have taken the Burning Pact there. I think that was just wrong. And we could have bought Field No Pain in the store. Um, Warcry some nice card draw. Headbutt helps a little bit. Second win some... Yeah, I don't know what I do here. I think, like, Bag of Preparation card remove Dex Pot is what I would do sitting here right now. Bag of Preparation to get our first turn better. That's going to be a big deal more in Act 3 hallway fights and elite fights than it is in the Act 2 boss fight, but it's very valuable in general. Um, card remove strips one of the chaff cards out of the deck, makes our two copies of Shrug it off a larger proportion of the deck. And then Warcry Plus helps us set up and get good front loading on turn one and two. That's what I would do sitting here right now. Curious to see what past Steven ended up doing there. Skip ahead a bit. Past Steven thought for a long time. I'm not particularly surprised. This seems like a very, very difficult store. <laughs> Past Steven is still thinking. Wait, what's wrong, Past Steven? <laughs> Oh, we have Courier. I think I just realized that we have Courier. Yeah, I had forgotten that. All right, so I was starting with Warcry, and then I remember that I have Courier, which causes the cards to restock, which means that there's a Shrug it off Plus here. So now we're clearly buying Shrug it off Plus. I assume we're buying Shrug it off Plus Bag of Preparation, unless we get a really strong other card. Did I buy Ghostly Armor over Bag of Prep? No, I didn't. I bought a Feel No Pain. Oh, I have two Havocs. Okay. Yeah, sure. I'm still upset that I don't have a bag of preparation, though. I forgot that I had two Havocs. Uh, we should card remove, right? Bought a ghostly arm. Yeah, we should have card remove. Whatever. <laughs> um, I think that that's bad. I think that we should have card removed, not bought a ghostly armor. Again, I think that I'm underselling how good the deck is there. I don't think the deck is that bad at blocking that we have to buy a ghostly armor. I don't remember this fight being all that close. We just like scale up, block the attacks that matter. Uh spend a very, very, very long time looking at turns, which don't seem like they should really be that important. <laughs> Fortunately, we're not on a clock as we play this run, I guess. Did he die before he got the Hyper Beam off? What a sick deck. We went for the Headbutt Heavy Blade plus play um, while we had 10 Strength and Pen Nib. Yeah, I guess I upgraded a Heavy Blade at a campfire and missed mentioning that. Alright, cool. So we're through Act 2. We didn't end up being super close to dying. Even if we hadn't killed him before he Hyper Beamed, we still had plenty of health to survive. And we're looking at Berserk, Fiend Fire plus, and Bludgeon plus. I think with all of our card draw and our Feel No Pain, this is a very, very, very easy Fiend Fire Plus. Fiend Fire Plus rewards you drawing lots of cards. It's really good at dealing tons of damage, which is a nice thing. Fiend Fire Plus is not a card that has to fit into any particular deck at all. It goes in any deck that can draw cards well, and this is a deck that can. Any deck with Sneko Eye is a deck that can. Some decks that can't even draw cards that well, like having Fiend Fire, it just deals so much damage. Just deals so much damage. And removing cards from your deck is very valuable mid-fight as well. As long as you're picking which cards you want to exhaust and correctly identifying which ones you want to hold on to. That's a really nice thing to be able to do. Berserk is still terrible. Bludgeon is 
like a fiend fire without any of the exhaust synergies and it costs more and it deals less damage so um this is why fiend fire is better than it yeah fiend fire is a super super spicy card take the fiend fire go on there it is all right and uh yeah we whiffed on energy again so this is contributing to why people wanted me to put this run on YouTube. Our options are Black Blood, which improves our sustain every fight from 6 for our Star Relic to 10. So it gives us an extra 4 health every fight, basically. There's an Aurary to choose um, from 5 different cards, or an Astrolabe to transform 3 of our current cards into random upgraded cards. Um, our deck is going to have to win off three and a bit energy. We have an offering, we have a sunflower, so we do have a little bit more than three energy per turn, but not much. We've also got all the havocs. We didn't buy a corruption at the store, so we don't have a corruption. If we had a corruption, the energy would be a little bit less relevant. But yeah, it's pretty hard to miss energy twice in a row in this game. It's like a one in 40 sort of occurrence. And even going through Act 2, I think we're like 6 out of 7 times or something. We get energy at the end of Act 2. So picking picking cards with the expectation that we weren't going to have a 4th energy for Act 3 didn't make that much sense. Skip ahead a bit. Um, I'm thinking about Astrolabe here, but there just aren't enough bad cards in the deck, I don't think. And we get auto-upgraded skills and attacks. So Aurori ends up being a better option by a decent distance. I'm not sure exactly what we're looking for with Aurori. None of those cards. Havoc. Power through. Vol. Probably. Alright, so yeah, we got some good stuff. When you grab R, you definitely want to look at the five card choices that you have available to you and try to work out which cards you're adding with full knowledge of which cards you can add. Because, like, Power Through gets better with Evolve. Power Through adds wounds to our deck, and Evolve draws us extra cards when we draw wounds. Um, power Through, I would probably pick even without Evolve, just because it's 20 block for one energy, which is incredibly good, especially in a deck which kills very rapidly. Um, it's not like the wounds that we're adding to our deck are going to matter that much because we're killing everything on turn like three or four usually. But yeah, with evolve power through gets even better. It means that the wounds are actually beneficial in like the Act 3 boss fight, for example. So there's a ton of thinking about card choices here. Flex Combust and Twin Strike is definitely a no-go. And of course I'm sitting here without actually showing the cards to decide on them. But I think I ended up going for the Power Through plus Evolve. That's uh, just a very solid combination of cards. I take another Inflame? I guess not. I took an Uppercut for more weak and I didn't take a Havoc. Third copy of Havoc. Why didn't I take a third copy of Havoc? Too many? Maybe three copies of Havoc is too many. Depletes the cards in the deck very rapidly. Gives us some hands where we don't actually get to spend energy. Makes makes it so less percentage of the deck is card draw or block. Yeah. I can imagine why not taking Havoc there is reasonable. I could definitely see taking Havoc there as well, but if I sit and think about it, I can see why I wouldn't want to. All right, so I am going to skip a bit through Act 3, because this deck is very set up. There isn't any decision that we're going to make that is going to massively change the deck at this point. Um, this is a chance for a second Heavy Blade Plus against Time Eater. I think that this is worth picking up. We've got a lot of Havocs, so being able to Havoc Heavy Blade twice is nice. We're pretty good at gaining strength. Yeah, I did pick it up. Heavy Blade is... You don't have to have Heavy Blades and Strength decks if they can block, but our deck can't block, so Heavy Blade's pretty solid. 
pretty sure I played that fight wrong. Most of these fights take like a couple of minutes to play, but only actually go two or three turns. Just how this deck works. So we're looking at Blood for Blood plus Iron Wave plus or Reckless Charge plus. Reckless Charge is good synergy with Feel No Pain and Evolve. So I expect Reckless Charge to get picked up here. Putting the Dazed into our draw pile, the Dazed is actually a good card in this deck, especially the second time through the deck. And I'm not too worried about hallway fights, so I do care more about the second and third times through the deck than the first time through the deck right now. If you're worried about hallway fights or elite fights which require front loading, um, care a lot about the first time through the deck. That means that something like uh, Metallicize goes down in value. Powers in general will go down in value. Um, cards which do good things straight away go up in value. But if you're not too concerned about those fights, or if like it doesn't really matter if you take a bit of damage in those fights because you can just rest or whatever, then you're probably going to want to be thinking about what the deck looks like in the second or third rotation through the deck. And at that point, we do have Evolve and Feel No Pain in play, so Reckless Charge starts becoming a very good card. That'll matter a bit more for, you know, late into the Time Eater fight. I get another offering here. I got a metallicize, but not another offering. Okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> this like giant maw worm thing fight is like the most boring fight in the game. Just always, we don't have to look at this fight. You just have to deal 300 damage to something, and sometimes it tries to attack you. It's sort of cute when it tries to attack you. It can't scale up. I don't know. Just takes a long time to kill it. We're looking to flex plus the fiend fire. Oh, we get a writhe out of that card matching game too. Flex plus fiend fire or a true grit. All of these are upgraded. I think taking true grit just to control the deck a little bit is really nice. We've got a feel no pain already, so it blocks for a ton. Fiendfire is great, but again, we care a little bit more about how we control the deck as fights evolve. Um, and a little bit less about how the deck works the first time through. Fiendfire is good at making the deck work well the first time through. Nemesis has um, never killed anybody in his entire, entire existence. You know, Nemesis used to actually be like a, a playable enemy but then everyone complained about Nemesis, and so they nerfed it so much that it's easier than most Act 2 hallway fights. <laughs> uh, which is great, I guess. Unless you enjoy your fights being difficult and engaging. Alright, we got an ornamental fan, and we're looking at a Twin Strike Plus, Heavy Blade Plus, and a Warcry Plus. Apparently just instantly took a Warcry Plus. That seems fine, we've got to feel no pain. It's not super incredible or anything, but it seems fine. At this point, we can take... Um, it's not even like we're 100% to win at this point, but the cards that we take don't matter nearly as much as they do at the start of the game. So we can take anything and win, or we can take anything and lose at this point, really. Um, and the lines between the values of different picks for cards are a lot narrower than they were earlier on in the game. So um, taking another Heavy Blade would have had value there. Taking the Warcry has value there. What song is this? Is this new? Huh. I don't remember hearing this uh, soundtrack before. Interesting. I just looked at the music files in my like game folder and set them to play. It's very pretty. Alright, uh, we're fighting some dude. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get like 150 to him with a fiend fire. Lol. We draw flex on a turn where we have no attacks. Lol. Um, 
<laughs> we got a clothesline plus a demon form and a corruption plus. This is like the third demon form we've been offered. We finally have reached a point where demon form is a good card. Just spamming completely random powers against Time Eater is a great strategy for beating Time Eater. Time Eater punishes you for playing cards which have low impact and powers. It's really hard for powers not to have high impact eventually. There are some crappy powers which have low impact forever, like fire breathing. But in general, powers are going to have a lot of impact over the course of a fight. So demon form, really nice, strong power. There's a corruption here as well, which wouldn't be terrible to take, but like demon form is just going to deal us a bunch of extra damage in the time meter fight. So ends up being a pretty easy pick, I think. Take the demon form, Steven. All right, we're fighting transient. Transient is a brand new enemy on the beta branch only right now. Doesn't have real art yet. It's being tweaked a little bit uh on this day playing the game the way it was set up was to deal 50 60 70 80 then 90 and then it kills itself um the trick is that if you deal damage to it it reduces its strength for the turn so we just clotheslined it which weakened it it also reduced its strength by 14 for the rest of the turn in this case so transient rewards you for having a deck which outputs a lot of stuff early on in the fight. Stuff is happening, stuff is happening, stuff is happening, stuff is happening. Did we win yet? We're taking a ton of damage because Transient was ridiculous. Transient has been nerfed since this iteration and is still ridiculous. Like, look at this turn. Yeah, we have a Heavy Blade in our hand, so we're completely fine. But still, look at this turn. <laughs> Being attacked for 90. If you just draw a bad hand on that turn, you just die. Your run's just over. And there are lots of perfectly reasonable decks which can fail to draw a hand that can have 90 output on a turn. It's not... <laughs> That's not like a guarantee, even for decks which are very good. Feel No Pain is an auto-pick in this store. Power through is great, card remove is fine. Power through, then shockwave, I guess. Sure. The low pain's very, very, very strong in the stack with the havocs and the true grit and the fiend fire. Just creates a lot of block for us. Should I try to like? hide the fact that I don't think Act 3 is as interesting or as well balanced as Act 1 or 2? Or, or do you guys like me the way I am? Let me know, please. Uh, we got a Disarm Plus, Feel No Pain, and a Fire Breathing Plus here. So Disarm Plus versus Feel No Pain is a pretty interesting choice. I think since Time Eater has multi-attacks, you end up going Disarm Plus, but both of the options are very strong. Yeah, you just go Disarm Plus here. It's not actually that close, I don't think. If we're against Donu Daka, maybe Feel No Pain's better. Also against Time Eater with a Demon Form in our deck, we're happy to um, deliberately have low output sometimes. And uh, Disarm's better on low output turns than Feel No Pain is. Um, am I explaining that well? So against Time Eater, you don't want to play a ton of cards necessarily, because the more cards you play, the more strength Time Eater gets. And so being able to... I just gave away a fairy in a bottle? Wow. Um, <laughs> being able to um, play Disarm so that he like, attacks you for 9 less, and then you just play like 1 or 2 cards can be nicer than like playing a uh, feel no pain and then when he attacks you for nine more than he would have if you had played the disarm you have to like play a card or two and exhaust them to get enough block off feel no pain to deal with that we're fighting the guy who requires you to deal 300 damage to him again see how massively this deck has changed over the course of the last like 20 floors it used to be that I deal 120 damage in the first three turns. But as we reach a point of the run where dealing 120 damage in the first three turns just doesn't do anything anymore, there's no reason to try to do that. 
So now what our deck is trying to do instead is set up powers, scale into turn like four and five, and get strength gain going. He's still at basically max health right now. We've added a bunch of cards which don't attack to the deck. But the end result is going to be that we like kill him very emphatically. It's just that our damage profile has changed. Our damage profile used to be all front loaded. And we've moved into a situation where our damage profile is now almost entirely focused on backloading. So we're trying to deal our damage at the end of the fight instead of the start of the fight. Because trying to deal our damage at the start of the fight just doesn't do enough damage to kill stuff anymore. I think it's like looking at how much damage we have against this maw and comparing it to how much damage we had on uh, this turn early on in the fight. Um, in like Act 2 is is really instructive. Oh, I think the reason we got rid of Fair and Bottle was because we had Entropic Brew. Yeah, okay. So Entropic Brew is the rightmost potion. I think this is on the main branch already. I don't remember. But if you're out of potions... Well, Entropic Brew fills all of the empty potion slots you have with new potions, basically. So if we had kept Fairy in a bottle, we would not have been able to get a new potion out of Entropic Brew, unless we'd already died with Fairy in a bottle. What Fairy in a bottle does is when you go to zero health, it revives you with 10% health. So it would have given us 8 health there. Yeah, using Entropic Brew right now, as you can see. So I remember this Time Eater fight being pretty close in the end. He attacks for 43 straight away. Our deck's not particularly good at blocking, especially when it's not set up right now. We've got cards like Anger, which we added very early in the game, which are just not good cards anymore. Um, and we're having to, you know, cope with the fact that cards like that are in our deck. We still have a Rupture in our deck, because for whatever reason, I just absolutely refused at all times to ever remove a card from my deck at any of the stores that we've been to for the last like 17 of floors. I don't know why. I don't know. <laughs> don't know. So, we definitely take some early damage here. Ended up solving that turn pretty well though. can see the power of Disarm. He's attacking for 9 here, which is just not very much for a late game boss to attack you for. Was this actually a difficult fight? Feel no pain, fiend fire seems obvious to me. You can also just feel no pain, feel no pain here and it's fine too. Hmm. We only have two cards left before he ends our turn. Yeah, you can feel no pain, feel no pain. There's an Evolve Plus. That's the last card of the hand. Checking how much exhaust we have left in our draw pile changes this. Yeah, okay. So we deal considerably less damage. But again, like I was saying with our damage profile, we're trying to deal damage less rapidly now than we used to be. Now we have to, like, we're playing demon form here. Either way, we have to decide whether we're going to metallicize in demon form or shrug it off and demon form. Which is a matter of whether we want 12 block now or 12 block over the next four turns and then more block than that afterward. Which again... We care what cards are coming up next. I think I like Metallicize. Cool. Alright. Doesn't this deck have cards that block in it? <laughs> Maybe it doesn't. I thought it did. I thought at some point we'd gotten this. Definitely taking some damage right now. Bloodline Shrug Havoc is going to be enough block there, right? I'm going to Havoc first in case we don't even need to do all that stuff. Cool, power through is great. So now we can like 
inflame clothesline. I think that clothesline is better than bash. Excellent work past Steven. We do not have Evolve in play, and we've just put in Wounds into our deck, so we do have some chance of getting very nasty hands. One reason that I might not have put a Havoc into my deck earlier is against Time Eater, Havoc does count as two cards played, which is a bit nasty. Ooh, I thought we'd go for three cards played there. Okay, I like it. Just ending the turn. We end turn here as well. We're going very, very, very light on output on these turns to stop Time Eater from gaining more strength. So that Demon Form has time to win us the run, basically. Demon Form slowly ticking up. I think I should have gone with my gut and just not blocked there. Or uh, not ended the turn there. Whatever. So now we have a Pendib. We've got 15 strength. There's a Heavy Blade. There are actually two Heavy Blades right on top of the deck. Trying to work out how we split, or if we want to just kill without letting him heal even. Okay, yeah, that's the play that I was thinking about. It's amazing how similarly current Steven plays to past Steven. <laughs> uh, now we start heavy blading. We go heavy blade, headbutt, heavy blade. Does that kill him outright? I don't think it quite kills him outright, but it leaves him dead next turn, I believe. It also guarantees that he is um, healing himself next turn instead of attacking us. We're going to have 19 strength next turn. He's vulnerable on 87 health. So as long as we draw any reasonable cards, he just dies. Have to make sure that we play at least five cards either way so that we have room to play lots of stuff. But yeah, there you go. That was a really good run. Very unique Ironclad deck. Very unique path to winning that Ascension 15 run. I wanted to VOD review this run specifically because I think that the thing that holds people back most in this game is thinking that your deck has to be normal. Like that it has to follow certain criteria to win at the highest level. And it's just not true. <laughs> And I think that this run um, highlighted to how not true that is very, very, very well. This is a... This deck is just a, an absolute mess. At all moments of the entire run, there is nothing about this deck that is anything other than messy. It's a messy headache. And uh, it actually ended up being quite strong. I think it was stronger than I was evaluating it as being for Act 2. And, and winning regardless. It eventually learned how to block, sort of. It was always pretty good at dealing damage. It transitioned really cool ways. It transitioned from front-loading damage into actually going all in to the point of alpha striking into um, eventually turning into a deck which... Let's get this back up. Hey, I'm back! eventually turning into a deck which could actually scale on strength and block pretty well. So it had very noticeable... What is wrong with my green screen? <laughs> had very noticeable and impactful transitions throughout the run and what it was trying to do. I think that's a big deal, but something to keep in mind. That you don't want to be building the same deck for the entire run. You need a deck that deals with what's coming up next in the most efficient way for it to do so. 
And I think this one did a good job of it. So, that was an hour and a half. I'm just going to upload this in one part. Uh, congratulations if you made it through. I hope you enjoyed the chat. I've had fun hanging out with you. Let me know if you enjoyed this. I don't know if I'm going to make a bunch of these that are an hour and a half long each, but hopefully there was some interesting discussion that you got something out of. And yeah, we got to talk about this really cool ironclad deck. So thanks for tuning in, guys. I have links to everything below the video and stuff like that. Um, I'll try to respond to YouTube com comments. I'm over on Twitch streaming like pretty much every day. If you want to come see me live. It's easier for me to make Twitch content than it is for me to make YouTube content, for sure. It's more enjoyable for me. It takes less time for me. It pays me more. So, I like making YouTube content sometimes too, but um, Twitch is where to catch me if you don't see me on YouTube. All right. Bye-bye, guys.